Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from wherever you join us. Thank you for being here uh, with us today. We're waiting a little bit for the room to populate um, just to make sure everybody's in the right place. Uh, we're here for resetting the media freedom imperative in Africa's democratic agenda. Uh, thanks again for joining us and thanks for our panelists who are here with us today. Um, before we start the um, event, just a couple of logistical details. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so you'll have access to the video afterwards. And also, if you ask uh, your questions, those will be recorded as well. Um, please keep an eye on the chat because I will be sharing a few uh, important uh, links and information about the sponsors of the event and about our panelists and about future events. Um, I will now give the floor to Professor Jeffrey Goldfarb from the New School for Social Research in New York, um, and also chair of the Democracy Seminar, one of the co-sponsors. Jeff. Thank you, Lala. It's a uh, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, the topic of our discussion today is uh, on media and democracy. Uh, the formal title is Resettling uh, Media. I'm actually, I lost the title, but uh, 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 Anyone who came knows what the title is. Uh, uh, we're, today, we're going to have a, a relatively open and formal discussion about the problems of democracy uh, in Africa, uh, especially as media uh, facilitate and under, uh, undermine uh, the democratic prospects. Uh, the Democracy Seminar is uh, uh, very, very happy to be sponsoring this event. Uh, Democracy Seminar has its roots in considering uh, democratic alternatives, uh, clandestine discussions in East Central Europe in the 1980s. Uh, uh, and uh, in recent years, we've kind of recreated uh, uh, the seminar to solve, uh, to address the problems of uh, democratic decline uh, and uh, uh, around the world. Uh, uh, we're interested in the, the, the problems of uh, defending democracy, uh, uh, recreating democracy, uh, reimagining democracy uh, to address the problems of our times. And, and as we do that, there's uh, no more important arena than uh, the arena of the media. And today we're going to uh, a group of media experts, media professionals, practitioners uh, are going to discuss uh, uh, this problem, uh, uh, trying to uh, not only um, uh, analyze the nature of the problems, but try to uh, consider ways that um, the media actually can act to overcome the problems of the present time. With that in mind, uh, we've brought together four distinguished uh, uh, experts and practitioners. Uh, and uh, we'll start with uh, Toby Oluwaltoa, uh, who will, uh, I apologize for butchering your last name, your family name, uh, um, uh, who um, is uh, uh, not only one of the participants, but also one of the, the um, um, uh, co-sponsors. Now, I have to say that uh, the way we're going to proceed uh, is first, each panelist is going to introduce uh, themselves very briefly and explain uh, what they see as a major problem or what they would like us to discuss. And then we'll have an open discussion to uh, um, uh, uh, follow up on their introductions. So Toby, please. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, um, for that um, kind introduction. So my name again is Toby Uluwatola. I'm the Acting Executive Director at the Center for Journalism, Innovation and Development. Um, we are a media innovation um, think tank um, here in, um, located in Abuja. And um, what we um, set out to do is to um, develop, is to engender um, a media landscape across West Africa that um, um, advocates and promotes democratic accountability um, and in the service of sustainable development. And, we, um, we, and, and this really um, is, this discussion really is at the heart of what we do um, because um, we believe very strongly that 
and uh, you, you will hear in the, the you know, a, a recurring theme as this conversation goes on, um, because I, I believe it's a shared belief um, for most of us um, on this platform and in the media, um, that the media is critical to democracy. And without a functional media, democracy can not survive. I think it was Thomas Jefferson um, who said that um, if asked whether to choose um, between the in newspapers without a government or a government without newspapers, um, I will hesitate, I will cast hesitate for a minute before I say um, I choose the former, um, meaning that um, newspapers are uh, so critical to um, people governing themselves because that's the, that's, that's the basis for people getting truthful information on which they can make um, the right decisions in self-governance. So it's critical, but um, there are challenges that affect the media's ability um, to do that work. Um, to the, um, in all, um, uh -huh, and for, for most of us, for those of us in West Africa, for example, and I imagine um, across um, Africa, uh, it's embedded in the constitution that um, at least for Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Gambia, um, and, like, and Ghana, it's, it's a constitutional duty to keep governments accountable. But in Nigeria, as an example, it, there is that duty without um, the corresponding powers to do it. Um, so you've got um, a, you know, um, a, a situation where um, there are rising autocratic government, it, 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 um, lots of autocratic government, governments you know, coming up across, across the region, um, particularly um, um, the, the Western region of Africa, but I imagine across, West, across Africa as well, we've seen um, recently um, three coup d'etats, um, and we've seen even supposedly democratic government, governments that are autocratic in outlook. So there is a regime of press on freedom that stifles the media's ability to do this work. The second problem that we see um, with the media um, doing its work is the fact that there is a lot of, you know, the, we, we, the media is losing the public sphere a little bit. Um, and um, with the advent of the digital um, um, giants and, um, and the social media influencers um, that drive these, um, these channels, um, there is a, a, an onslaught, and we, we see it across the world um, from um, Ukraine and Russia to um, the US elections um, to um, Brexit, we see uh, an onslaught of, um, of misinformation and disinformation um, that makes it difficult for the media to do its work effectively and to reclaim you know, its space, um, the, its duty of really um, being the guard, um, the last shield of the, of the public sphere, um, the gatekeeper of the public sphere. And then the third problem is um, the sustainability problem. Um, where I come from, um, in Yoruba land, we have a saying um, which goes like, oh, low, low, low light, yeah. Meaning that you don't have money, you say you have ideas. Um, and that is a challenge that the media has had to, to grapple with, um, um, the, an uns unsustainability challenge. And it's even more exacerbated um, in the digital era with um, ad revenues going to the big players um, versus um, the people who actually create the content. So the, the, the purpose of this dialogue really is, so th those are key ex exogenous challenges that the media faces in its ability to um, promote democratic accountability, be the agenda setter, gatekeeper, and watchdog of democracy. But um, we're not here to gripe about the problems. Um, the purpose of this conversation is to get to some solutions. And I look forward to um, um, discussing with my colleagues on this call, um, on this webinar, some of the ways in which the media can start to reclaim um, that um, constitutional duty and um, human rights duty of um, protecting um, the uh, democracies around the world. Thank you very much, Toby. Asha, do you want to uh, uh, re introduce yourself and uh, re add to that? Yes, absolutely, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Um, first, I think I'd like to thank uh, your organization, the Democracy Seminar, the New School for Social Research and Thoughts, and MACE Advisory 
And of course, uh, my colleagues from Nigeria, I'm a big fan of uh, Toby, your organization and the work that you do. My name is Asha Mwilu. I'm a journalist based in Nairobi. I've worked as an investigative reporter for more than 10 years. And quite recently, about two and a half years ago, I stepped out of mainstream uh, TV journalism in Kenya to start my own organization called Debunk Media. And we are an independent uh, media platform where we, we produce multimedia content geared towards younger audiences, especially on social media. So I think that Toby has set the stage really well. Just to describe the ecosystem, I think the problems that exist, whether they are issues of sustainability and funding of the media, or whether they are um, the rise of authoritarianism around, around the world, I think we are facing very similar challenges. And I think um, I do agree with you, Toby, that the conversation needs to be more solutions oriented. Um, but my perspective is that having seen the space that I worked in in mainstream media and having seen sort of like the gradual deterioration of, of public interest media, I think that before we can really find the solutions to the challenges we're facing, we have to do a bit of introspection, right? I've, I've spoken to colleagues even from the US who talk about the role that the media played during the Trump presidency and um, the contribution to sort of like this polarization of audiences and, and the decisions that media took um, that led to even a, 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 a faster widening gap between, between people um, who hold different views. I have a sort of like a case study from Kenya that I usually look at uh, very critically when I think about the future of media in, in, in not just in Kenya, but in East Africa. Um, of course, we know the world we're living in, uh, driven by social media, driven by the internet of things. Um, the challenges that we're facing are, of course, issues of misinformation, disinfo, the, the role that the, the big tech platforms are, are playing um, to the sort of like a deterioration of democracy in our countries. We know about internet shutdowns as a response from a lot of the authoritarian regimes. I mean, Kenya is surrounded by you know, countries like Uganda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, all of whom have experienced several internet shutdowns over the last three to four years. But something very interesting happened in Kenya. So Kenya is, is considered to be one of the more vibrant countries when it comes to press freedom and when it comes to the, the media ecosystem in general. Um, we have, I, I think some of our colleagues in Ethiopia and Uganda actually say that we might have a bit more, like too much freedom <laughs> just because of the kind of things that we're able to say in our media. Um, we, are, we have a population of about 55 million people. And uh, in, last year, the Reuters uh, Institute released their annual digital news report. And they showed that uh, the sources of news in Kenya were 73% of people in Kenya said they got their news from TV, 36% said from print, and 76% said online and social media. Uh, we, the internet penetration is at around 85%. And um, we, it's estimated that by the year 2025, Kenya will have about 7 million new mobile phone subscribers. So you can see that it's a very, uh, vibrant uh, economy, and especially on the aspect of communication and the internet, it, it, it's 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 really you know um, one of the one of the, the the leading countries in the continent. Now, in February of 2015, the Kenyan government was transitioning um, our broadcasting transmission systems from an analog to a digital one. Uh, this was this was meant to largely democratized the space uh, because there were less than, let's say about five major players controlling the broadcasting media in Kenya. And this was referred to as the digital migration. I'm sure a lot of the, my, my um, Africans here would, would know, you know the, the process that your countries have gone through with the digital migration. Now in Kenya, this process was disputed because media owners of the three top TV stations contested the digital switch. At that time in 2015, they claimed that 90% of Kenyans would have no access to TV if the government were to transition the country from analog to digital uh, transmission. 
Um, but the government said about 60% of people had already bought set-top boxes and they had given licenses to two Chinese farms. Media owners said they wanted, like, they wanted an opportunity and they wanted an extension of three months to procure their own set-top boxes, to be in control of the hardware. But the government said, you have to, you have to move to the digital space. So to protest this move, the three most watched, the three most reliable TV stations in Kenya switched off their signals for a couple of days. And it was a move of self-censorship. For almost one week, Kenyans would not get uh, TV news apart from the state broadcaster, which is not very independent. It's not like the BBC, it's not like the NPRs of this world. And one other TV station that is owned by the president and his family. So that was a very big move in Kenya. Um, it was unprecedented. So of course the AMPAS uh, was sold and eventually everyone switched their signals back on. Now fast forward to 2017, Kenya, right now we're having a, a general election in the, in the next three months. Um, and during election years, you know, Kenya is usually uh, a country of interest for not just Africa, but the rest of the world. So in 2017, we had one of those very heated elections. Um, the election result was contested by one of the main presidential candidates, uh, Rai Laudinga, who is a former prime minister and a presidential candidate this year as well. And he said that his, his vote had been stolen. So what did he do? He went and held a parallel inauguration ceremony and saw himself in as the people's president. This event was, um, of course, there was a lot of police pro presence and the state tried to stop um, that event. And that led to you know, the killing of a couple of people who were supporters of Mr. Raila Odinga. TV stations carried this event live. And how the state responded was by going to the three top TV stations that I had mentioned earlier, the ones that had switched themselves off um, a few years before, about two years earlier, and switched off their signals and told them that their licenses would be withdrawn because they were carrying this event live and they were reporting about this event. That was never expected. That turn was not expected because um, the age of state censorship in Kenya had ended um, after the dictator, President Daniel Arap Moy, was ousted from power in 2002. In 2007, when Kenya had had uh, very violent uh, elections, um, there was only a seven minute delay of, of TV broadcasting. So this move of the state to switch off TV stations was unprecedented. I give these two examples because one, was an act of self-censorship driven by commercial interests. And the second one was a, an act of state censorship. I don't think there's been enough um, academic work on the effect of that first incident, which was the act of self-censorship. But from where I sit, I was working for um, one of the, the TV stations that switched themselves off. I've worked for two of those TV stations throughout my career. And I can tell you that that move in 2015 to switch off our own signals, to get ourselves off the air, an act of protest through self-censorship had an effect on how audiences perceive us. Perceived us then, and the gradual decline of public trust in media in Kenya. I say this because, um, of course, Toby, you mentioned all the issues that we're now facing. Um, we, media is um, it's built on the machine age and not the information age. And so, you know, we are, we've always been optimized by speed, by distribution, beating competition. And yet now in this world of the internet, in this world of social media, in this world of everyone being able to be a broadcaster, we have now forced our, we've been forced to churn out clickbait content, right? The priority is on quantity and not quality. Um, important news values like accuracy, like privacy, like truth are often entirely neglected to feed this new beast that is social media, that is you know, the big tech companies. And so I look at these two issues as sort of like the backbone of my introspection as a journalist, um, that if we're going to think about solutions, we have to think about the role that we play in society. 
we have to think about why we exist. And while, of course, we have to be sustainable, we have to make money, we have to continue with our production, our primary role is public interest. Our, our, our work is guided by public interest. It's guided by truth. It's, it's guided by democracy. It's guided by the needs of our communities. And whichever, I think the problems with, will always evolve, but if we think about the fundamental reason why we exist, then we're able to come up with solutions. And I think I will leave the stage to my colleagues, perhaps to pick up from there and hopefully maybe to contest my ideas. Um, but just to, I, I think this is a really good platform for us as practitioners to introspect and think about how we can, we can do better for our communities. Jeffrey. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, a really interesting, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, deeply uh, uh, meaningful uh, example and charge. And I saw, uh, and I have to say that uh, many of the problems that you refer to seem uh, like problems that uh, we face here in New York and in the United States. They're, they're not foreign at all. Though, of course, they got, they're manifested very differently. This is terrible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 but I saw Estina shaking her head in, in, in great agreement with you. And, and so, so I'd like to hear uh, 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 what she has to say at this point. Please. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Estina. Marian Boymadi Taylor. I am from Sierra Leone and I am the public relations officer for women in the media Sierra Leone, an organization that was founded uh, November 20, 2007. And we're female journalists from both Queens, Electronic, and that we consider the digital media space as well. And our main aim is to amplify the voice of female journalists, um, to make sure that they're able to use their platforms to advocate for welfare and equal rights for women and girls in Sierra Leone. And our work as an organization is to help bridge that space between women and girls and organizations that have the mandate to support and represent them and surface stories. But um, that's about women in the media Sierra Leone. And I've been a journalist um, for over a decade. I have worked um, in mainstream media. I worked as a reporter, as a presenter, as a broadcaster and sometimes an announcer as well. And I've also um, worked for BBC, BBC Media Action. I worked there for six years and I, I spent lots of time dealing with um, uh, media development issues and talking about these issues and presenting and producing issues like that. And then I started working for Honor Radar. So Honor Radar is um, a combination of digital and journalism. So we combine those skills all together to produce storytelling that reflects communities that are unheard. So our main job is on unheard communities. So I'm giving all of this background is to just um, um, talk about or to go in between like there are lots of issues. So I heard um, my colleague who's just speaking, talking about the issue of censorship, self-censorship and all of that. But let me give you a background about Sierra Leone and where we are now. So while some other countries around the world are still um, you know, grappling with the laws that, and policies that suppress freedom of speech, Sierra Leone is making some gains towards a press that's more stable. I'm, I'm st stressing more stable, towards a press that's more stable and kind of viable. In 2020, the government of Sierra Leone repealed the criminal and seditious libel law. That law has been born in the neck. So you can imagine me saying that. So they repealed that law after years of advocating for that, after years of talking and asking for that law to be repealed. So it was repealed in 2020, and that helped tremendously to, towards the strides of press freedom. We have no journalists in jail in relation to their practice of journalism. And then the incident of arresting on others from above has reduced drastically since 2020. Thus, the country moved from 75th position to 40, uh, um, 46 out of 180 countries in the world. 
and according to the World Press Freedom Index in 2022. But even with search gain, hmm, the media still grapples with systemic and economical issues that needs to be addressed to attain more viable and economically empowered media landscape. So um, now um, my um, colleague from East Africa mentioned the issue around um, trust, the public trust. So the media has the power to hold uh, um, duty bearers to account and promote uh, um, the rights of the people and other issues as well. But I ask a question, we recently had a media viability conference and I ask a question. So many times we say that the media has so much power, but why do we always feel that that power has been taken or is always taken away from us? Because of we are poor. We have poor business models that needs reform. We have um, internal accountability issues. There are lots of it because we say we are journalists and our duty is to hold um, duty bearers to account, but we must first hold ourselves to account. I truly, and I'm strongly behind that because most times we tend to like, like ask lots of questions, but say now in our organizations, now you're giving the power, you want, you, 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 you're supposed to be the person who represent the truth. Are we doing that firstly as an institution? So that brings me to poor business models, poor, um, and then self-censorship. So now, now so many media houses in terms of self-censorship, um, they're so scared that their license will be taken away from them. So what they do is they kind of like forget about the hard issues. And it's sad to say that in Sierra Leone, investigative journalism is dying. We're in desperate need. We're in desperate need of suggestions and recommendations on how to hold that thought. I'll give an example. So a few years back when I was in mainstream media, I was um, slowly moving towards investigative journalism. And my niche was covering sexual gender-based violence and all these other things. So there was an incident wherein um, somebody who is a stakeholder in my country was involved in molesting a child, sexually penetrating a child. I was threatened, I was intimidated, I was scared for my life because they called me and they, they would tell me that, um, you would not even know who's calling. They, they call with unknown numbers and say, if you continue to focus on this issue, we know where you live, we know your family. And these, this, this is a reality in Sierra Leone. So let me drive a bit into the um, uh, uh, um, in, in internal diversity issues. So, so many women that we are, are like that I have worked with and so many women that are part of women in the media when during or during elections or had stories or difficult um, things to cover, they, they run away from these things. Why? Because we are scared that our children, our, our lives, our families, they're at risk. And then you go online and then you post something that you have facts, you have fact checks, you have all the facts, you post it online and people going into your DM they are threatening you. You know, cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is so huge that women, female journalists, are scared for their lives. They're scared to post. They're scared to hold or to even thrive in the digital space. So these are all issues. Then the model that um, you know we have sole proprietorships for most of the media houses. And when it, when you talk about sole proprietorship, there is one. It's a one man business. I make my decisions. And these people, they are easily infiltrated by government, by stakeholders. And when they are infiltrated, they, 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 they decide what story to hear and what to completely leave events that they have covered. They would decide what to hear and what to completely leave out. And what's the most affected of all is the community um, 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 media houses. The community media houses who are supposed to promote the agenda. They're supposed to set agenda for the community, politically or developmental agendas. These people have been compromised. But now it's easy to say they have been compromised and just leave it there and move forward with it. But how, come to think of it, they can't even afford the day-to-day -day running cost for their organizations because these, these organizations or these media houses are, are um, 
a, 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 a um, um, responsible to bring news, local news, to bring local stories and propagate the truth. But for, for most of them, they don't have money to do the running course. So political figures, stakeholders in these communities who know about these issues, who are well aware, what they will do is they will stay in the background. They will support these media houses, but they call the shorts. Who call, who, um, there is a saying that always, we always say in Sierra Leone, who, 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 plays, who, who plays the piper calls the tune. So it's a huge deal in Sierra Leone. And we are grappling with brown, brown paper journalism. So all you can, all you hear when you pick up a newspaper in Sierra Leone, you 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 would you would miss objective stories, investigative stories, because all you see is press briefing stories, stories that are, that that have um um ulterior um, motives, an agenda behind. You would see people intentionally spreading disinformation intentionally trying to misinform propaganda people supporting the party the government that's ruling these are the things that are eating us in in in, in west africa and in sierra leone in general i'd love to stop there and we can continue the conversation thank thank you very much Justina, and uh uh for an interesting conversation, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, presentation, we'll follow up on it, Bronco. So um, I just want to point out is that, you know, when I listen to uh, examples of my colleagues from different countries, I feel incredibly spoiled <laughs> with the type of problems we have, you know. Um, our problems are in some way, so, in sorry, some I, ways- I want to uh, emphasize, actually, you're speaking of South Africa now. Apologies, I, I spoke I speak about South Africa, yeah. So uh, just let me give you a bit of a background. Daily Maverick is a South African daily newspaper online. Uh, we um, have around 100 people working for us. We got around three, three to 400 contributors and we have around 6 million readers. And we actually also publish a weekly newspaper that actually comes out on Saturdays. Believe it or not, we started it uh, in the middle of a pandemic, which was a very unusual move to, to, to pull in those days. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we have a problems in South Africa, which are in some way um, problems that the uh, first world countries have, but we also have a problems that uh, we should be sharing with the rest of Africa. We, so the problem with the, with the first world world countries is that um, we all de de in a desperate search for business model that will actually um, be able to um, put together, which is obviously a public mandate, a man mandate to tell the truth to the to the people of, of um, South Africa at the same time to be able to you know pay the reporters you know reporters uh, deserve to be paid and they deserve to be paid well for, for their work so, uh, so on the other side we, we got um, quite a few problems that we share with uh, with, uh, with uh, brothers and sisters from from uh, the rest of Africa we um, there's a huge number of media deserts that's being opened now in in the in our country, um, uh, local publications are uh, dying. Let's be honest, local journalism in South Africa is dying. Uh, and it's uh, basically not being covered properly at all or not covered um, at all. So um, so that is a massive problem. My, my, my also big problem is that, that we, um, if you look at Africa as a continent, um, the problems we have Basically, the problem is that um, even the, 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 the developed countries are going to have in a few years. Uh, and I think the biggest problem is that overwhelming majority of the presidents, uh, or, because they are all elected officially in, in Africa, have managed to hack the democracy. And they managed to hack the democracy that uh, indeed you have elections and people indeed can put, um, you know, uh, the cross next to the name. Uh, but what happens before that, and even more importantly, what happens afterwards is not in, any, in their control. So we have a democracy without accountability. And one of the reasons why we have no accountability because it is because the, the, the governments have managed to very effectively, um, um, basically um, ruin the media's ability to report and to hold them accountable. So, um, it is a it is a massive problem, and I think that problem is coming to the countries of so called first world war very 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 soon. Um, we, you know, most most of us uh, 
you know, basically facing the, the, the same problems as, as, as my colleagues have, have mentioned before. Are we going to chase the clicks? Are we going to chase the, the truth? And we in Delhi Mavic, we decided to chase the truth. Uh, but let me tell you, it's very, very difficult. It is, a, it is, a, it is existential problem. Um, and it, and it's, we, we are struggling and it's very difficult to find a model in which you can afford to um, employ um, enough journalists for all the things that you have to cover. In South Africa, especially now with the uh, with erosion of quality, erosion of numbers for journalists, we lost an incredible no uh, number of people in, uh, during pandemic, the, the number of jobs. Is, um, the, the, the problem is that quite often, if you don't cover the, the issue, issue doesn't co get covered at all. So quite often we don't have a luxury of choosing to be focused on one or another thing because you know so many other things are going to slip slip through the through the cracks. Essentially, in a in a in a you know municipalities of South Africa where the greatest failure of the of the governance NCU governance um, um, uh, it actually happens you know every day. And um, there's, there's just about nobody to hold them accountable. And that's where we are now trying to actually spread our wings and try, trying to spread our coverage to finally, finally, um, you know, um, bring accountability to that level. Um, but it is a, it is a terrifyingly uh, difficult fight. And I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, it's most, most days it feels like a losing fight. Yes. So, 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 so as I'm... Um... Uh, hearing you and looking at your colleagues, everyone, and also our discussions before we went uh, live with the public, uh, this issue of um, the project of being accountable and the difficulties of being accountable kind of um, uh, charges everyone. And I, ha and I have to also say that uh, what's described, what was described here is the first world problem uh, it strikes me that uh, as far as sustainability and, and, and paying for journalists, it, it, it's very much uh, uh, a continental a problem as well. It's a global, yeah. And, and, it's and, and, and it, 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 it's striking how, of course, it's manifested differently in different places, but that we're all facing this. And, and uh, these, uh, this crisis of media is actually... Um, um, uh, uh, a significant part of the crisis in democracy. So, so uh, 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 Istina is shaking her head in agreement. So I, I'd like to hear what she has to say and, uh, and we can kind of uh, go around, you know, talk to each other about uh, the issues raised. And I'll remind you that we also agreed that we want to not only, uh, we, we'll spend a certain amount of time analyzing the problems, but we also want to spend some time uh, considering uh, some practical things that people are doing to uh, 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 kind of address the problems. So Istina, please. Yeah, in terms of the like um, issues that you have mentioned in West Africa, especially in Sierra Leone, you know, journalists don't always, uh, um, or media houses don't always choose what's best for public interest. Instead, they are greatly influenced by government. Uh, or politicians uh, or political figures who support them in the background. And this has led to the public questioning the independence of most of, me of the media institutions or media houses during um, Ebola. So we had Ebola and there were lots of misinformation that um, went around and people were saying the media, listen, uh, um, the media was, you know, playing a very, very, um, sad role because most of them were acting as experts rather than calling the expert. So that led to um, serious um, 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 distrust between the public and the people. Uh, I'm sorry, the public and the media. And when we had um, COVID-19, it was hard for the media to be able to say, okay, now we, we know that when there are health crises, we have to call um, uh, um, the experts rather than we, we being the expert ourselves. But it's hard because um, the media in Sierra Leone, I would speak uh, um, because I have worked in the media in Sierra Leone for a long time, is losing the gatekeeping abilities because we are still fighting the bread and butter issues of sustaining itself. Journalists are scared to cover real stories in fear of intimidation, harassment, detention. So the self-censorship, 
it's happening all around. So what are we going to do? So in Sierra Leone, them, we looked at it in a way that, okay, now we, our, the most difficult thing is if we, to transform the media and make sure that the media able to uh, um, pay journalists, pay its staff and make sure that the, John, the media able to run the, uh, the, the, different, the institution itself so that we will not depend on the government. So we started this media um, viability and investment conference. We had the first conference this year. And before the conference, we had um, um, play, uh, um, um, talks before the conference. We, have diff we had different um, um, meetings, different programs hosted, wherein journalists will talk about how we can um, um, emancipate, if I can use that word, how we can emancipate the media and all of that. In that conference, we had um, different case studies from um, uh, East Africa. We had a journalist from the um, organization in Kenya coming to the conference to talk about uh, um, how they've been able to get support. So our um, discussion now is support from the government because the government supports the, um, uh, um, the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists with some amount of money that, is co that comes as a subvention. But with all of those supports, we need arm's length uh, uh, um, uh, um, 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 approach. Because it, most times, as I said earlier, who pays the piper calls the tune. So these are the, the, the worry of the public. And they are still, the public, you know, they lack trust in us because for lots of times, the media has let down the, 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 the public because we have few organizations in Sierra Leone who are really supporting or who are really pushing towards public interest and push, putting out stories that really interest the public, that are really the voice of the horn herd. So I think I'll stop there because there are lots of things that others want to mention as well. Asha, did I see that you were ready to uh, add, add a point there? Um, yeah, I think I, I, I think there's a point that Branco has raised, the issue of, um, democracy or is it an illusion of democracy that we now have if you follow i think all the elections in in africa certainly the ones that have taken place in the last two three four years you do see this aspect of hacking democracy in kenya for instance this 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 election year the president the current president has a horse in the race right that he has fully endorsed that he has um, is fully supporting, um, you know, Ray Laudinga, who was formerly his own, his political opponent, is now dubbed a state project, right? Chosen by by the current president. So uh, before that, previously, we know about Cambridge Analytica and the role that they allegedly played in the Kenyan election. So from where we sit and looking at how audiences think. Um, looking at where they get news, their, their, their consumption uh, patterns. Well, from our small organization, we feel that one of the things that you can do is to tell good stories, right? Um, Branco has certainly said it's a world of clicks. So what do you do? What do you choose, clicks or truth, right? But you're also competing in this world where um, if, it's, if you're not fighting the algorithm, you're fighting you know, gossip bloggers, you're fighting individual publishers, you're fighting uh, you know, bloggers, or, you're, you're, or rather, let me not use the word fighting, but your, your, your content is up against uh, those agents. So how do you make sure that audiences still want to read the news, are still interested in, 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 in important conversations? Because you see a lot of surveys saying that people are just switching off from the news because it's either too negative, it's too depressing. I want to think of something else, you know, it's too political or it doesn't align with my political bias. Very many reasons. Um, so we feel, in fact, our mantra is that every society deserves good storytelling. And so when, we, when you go to our platform, you will see stories that you can't see either on mainstream newspapers, in mainstream newspapers in Kenya, or other uh, uh, publishers in, on the digital platform because we prioritize good storytelling, we prioritize nuance, we prioritize you know, depth, we prioritize investigation. And so that does take time, it does take more resources like Branco has said. 
Um, but I think, you know, Daily Maverick is one of those publications that is often quoted as a pioneer or a leader in, you know, a new quest to look at journalism differently, to innovate, to think of perhaps maybe monetizing from audiences. I would love to hear from Branko, if you will allow me, Jeffrey, just a question to Branko di directly. Sure. Branko, what do you think the future is? Because when you think about the issue of democracy and the trends that we're seeing politically, can how much of how much of it can media solve, right? And what are the important next steps for us from where you sit? You know, I, I, please, uh, Bronco, answer. I I actually uh, find the, uh, the the proposition that powerful storytelling may be a way of breaking through this uh, uh, really, really interesting. And that, so I'll ask Bronco to respond, but also ask Toby to uh, give his uh, view as uh, someone who's looking at the uh, general media landscape in the continent. Toby, please, and then, uh, uh, excuse me, Bronco, please, and then Toby. You're muted. Um, okay, so uh, look, it, it is it is a very complex, very difficult question, and depends on uh, on on a, a, a country we live in, you know. So we need to tailor um, our, our approach to to our countries specifically. But there are a couple of, couple of things that I think universal, and I think that's a that's a global problem that we have right now. And the global problem is is that we are in the middle of a disinformation war. Um, which has uh, cheapest tools at its disposal in the history of the planet, the history of our civilization. Okay, so that's a starting point. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in America, and if there's one one terrifying uh, lecture or lesson I I lesson sorry I I learned there is that um, they appear to be beyond um, um, beyond salvation uh, <laughs> in terms of. Uh, the tribalization is so deep, they, uh, it goes so deep that they can't even agree on a common reality. Okay, so and I think that is that is a very, very important element that um, we um, in Africa we need to look at. So um, philosophically, what we're trying to do in Delhi Maverick, and we, we will um, intensify um, uh, our efforts in, a, in the coming years is to become a center of trust and truth. Um, in our countries, so um, because if we as a, as a society um, lose trust and and lose understanding of what the truth is, um, we are basically destroyed as a civilization. Okay, so I think the the the, the media to start with would be that civilizational role that would insert us into, into central position. So whichever publication, whichever media entity manages to do it successfully and get into the center of it, um, I think has a good chance of being able to provide um, this, this, this center of truth and trust and at the same time, able to financially survive. And I'll tell you why, because what, we, what we're doing in South Africa and you completely correctly uh, uh, pointed we, we, are, we don't have a um, paywall. We, we don't, do not believe in a checkbook journalism. We don't believe that uh, only people with money should, should know the truth, okay? So um, what we are offering people of South Africa is to be, not to buy our product, but to be part of something better and big, uh, bigger and better, some uh, part of a movement, you know? And 17, more than 17,000 people so far and many, many, a, a, big donor um, heard of that call because in, in, in essence, there are two different types of decision. One is the, am I going to buy this product? Is it a good price? Am I going to use it? Is it good for me? Is it a good product? And the other is, am I going to be part of something really, really important for, for our country and for our community and for our society? And I think, I think that that would be the, 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 the response to your question is um, your storytelling and your, your importance to the society must be such that you uh, occupy the center and then um, people literally, um, you know, gauge 
um, um, their understanding of reality uh, um, by by reading your your stories and referring to to to, to your publication. Um, so it, it it is a way again. So it's a way to sustain us for a long time, but it's also um, I think the ultimate service we need to put to, to the, um, provide to, to to our societies because. Um, we are being divided, divided system, systemically and systematically uh, all over the world. Literally, every country in the, in the world has this problem, and um, it is. Uh, I, I believe the Ukraine war is a massive problem. I believe that Taiwan, possible Taiwan invasion, is also a massive problem. But I believe that longer term problem, which is going to be very difficult to solve, is the is the tribalization of that of the entire humanity. And so as a, as a response to, to it, if we can contribute to the tribalization of the, the, the humanity by providing consistent truth and trust, over time, I think we have a chance of bringing um, people back from the extremes. And kind of, um, if you look at it in kind of in a, in a, uh, in a uh, kind of analytical way, um, the center is falling apart in most of our countries. People are being forced to to be either or, to be either, to in in a in the words of, of George W. Bush after the um, after the 9/11, you are either with us or against us. Um, no, we don't have to be with you or against you. We can be somewhere in the center. So I believe what we need to do, we need to help rebuild the center, because that center will be able to then provide a set of accountability for whoever is in power, which means we need to help rebuild institutions. Because um, just to just to add here, in South Africa, you know, first and second estate failed. Uh, I think judiciary failed, third estate failed quite badly, and the media failed probably ninety percent. So our our role, and um, again, I, I know I'm talking around it, but if you can actually pick up those things that you can apply in Kenya, uh, our role is to be indispensably true and indispensably trustworthy all the time. You know, and that will, uh, in a long term, that could give us long term sustainability and actually help you um, deliver on, on what a what a mandate is, because our mandate is actually to tell the truth to our people, you know, regardless of anything. You know, and I, I do honestly believe that right now um, that, that that this is the last last defense against against the onslaught of um, you know autocracy, global autocracy. I, I, I hope I hope that makes sense. It, it makes sense, and, and I, I just have to uh, add a little footnote before I turn to Toby that that for the past three or four years I've been calling myself a radical centrist. And, oh, wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and same, ac same. actually, with this this very thing in mind, you know, the the, the yeah. need to actually create a center where people of the left, right, and center, moderates, radicals, uh, religious people, uh, secular people can actually come together and, yeah. uh, 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 and find truth, find uh, co uh, common sense, a common ground. So uh, uh, I have some more things I wanna say about that. This is very exciting to me that you bring this up and that yeah. uh, everyone around this uh, uh, virtual table is uh, uh, nodding in agreement. So- uh, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff if, I, if I may just say so, just one, so one last thing is that you cannot provide a center, you can't rebuild the center without bringing back the fundamental decency, which has been lost from, you know, because shamelessness is the name of the game. We need to bring back decency because shamelessness is going to be so aggressive that decent people are going to be always in a, in a, in a kind of in defense. We have to bring decency and with decency, we, we come back to the center. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, I agree with you and Toby is shaking his head. So uh, I'm quite curious uh, what's behind uh, his uh, uh, nodding in agreement. <laughs> no, so I, I, I absolutely agree with um, what Branko just said. I, I think that so I was just following the um, elections in the Philippines and mm. how um, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Um, got elected Jesus president. Right. Um, and yeah. Jesus Christ, vice, I mean, really, uh, really. <laughs> his vice is now the daughter of, um, of Duterte. Um, and um, and, and it, it was literally through disinformation um, that they, yep. Yep. they won, yep. they won the um, and And so you've got a... You've got 
we've got autocratic actors who have figured out how to use the tools of democracy um, to achieve the same ends that they used to achieve with, with guns. They, and, they, hack, um, they hack to democracy. They, they are, they are, <laughs> they are. And, um, and, um, and, and because they've also been very successful in many cases um, of discrediting the media, the press, um, and the press has also, in many cases, also led itself um, to be, um, to be, to, to sort of aid, abet them in, in that process of, 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 this, um, of discrediting, you know, because we've not really stuck to um, what um, Branco calls fundamental decency. And I also want to add to that, um, that the, at the core, the ideology of human rights, the mm -hmm. ideology of, you know, what is, what is, what are the fundamental human rights that of everybody that we serve? Because the media um, serves everybody. Um, and one of the problems, the reason why that is so, and I wanna highlight another problem that I think Istina touched on a little bit, but didn't dwell on a lot, is the, the, uh, the very real problem of plurality mm -hmm. um, in, in ownership of media and how that then lends itself to the media um, sort of being biased one way or another um, in the um, ideological, to the ideological bents of his owners. And that is so, true so in the US. Expl explain exactly what you mean by plurality of ownership of media. Okay, so, so what I mean by plurality of ownership of media, so we've got a media ecosystem. So in Nigeria, for example, um, so we did a bit of a, we did a bit of a survey where we looked at the top newspapers um, in Nigeria and the top broadcast stations in Nigeria. And majority of them are owned by politicians. Um, so you've got um, Tinubu owning TVC. You've got um, um, Sam and Dazaya owning, owning leadership. You've got um, you've got um, um, channels owned by. Um, John Momo and, and so on and so forth, um, um, AIT, Raymond Dockwesi, who are all essentially politicians. Um, so, and the same is true, you know, in the US um, where you've got, you know, very powerful people to the right or to the left, you know, owning uh, media. And because, they, because, of that, because of that, it creates, you know, a, a trust issue, you know, because the media then tends to be, to, to write in the interest of, its owners. So when I say plurality, what we need is a slightly more diverse um, media ownership regime. Um, and, and this goes to something that Istina was talking about when she said that um, community media is essentially dead um, in Sierra Leone as it is in Nigeria, as it is in many of these countries. And, and a lot of it is, is because there is a, um, a challenge with, with funding. Um, so you know, and I, this I, is I, where... For the non-African participants, uh, perhaps yeah. you want to uh, explain e exactly what community uh, journalism is, a and um, okay. be because I th I think that this is a little foreign to many of us. Yeah. So what we mean by community journalism is is more local journalism, mm -hmm. more local journalism. That's what we mean, and and uh, when and in many cases local journalism that is owned by the communities that they serve, by um, the public interests um, um, that is in, in many cases funded by um, taxes and taxpayers uh -huh. funds. But it is in the public interest of the people in the communities that they serve. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, you know, is, is, is dead um, across West Africa and um, but what we, but, but what we, what, what is possible in today's world, and this is where um, I think um, Branko, um, what you guys are doing at Daily Maverick is very interesting. So um, again, let me first of all talk a little. So we, we, um, I run CJID, the Center for Journalism, Innovation and Development, we're a sister organization to Premium Times, which is a newspaper here in Nigeria. And, 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 um, and Dapo that, that, that is my good friend as well. Yes, I, I, I'm aware. <laughs> and, 
and um, and the newspaper and we we really pride ourselves um, in doing um, investigative journalism um, and but but we but and and we and news to give some background um, when premium premium time started with the core team that used to belong to two, two three four next which was another newspaper that was um, that prided itself in investigative journalism but then was was literally aggressively butchered by economically by the government when they wrote some stories that um, um, unearthed some um, corruption in the oil and gas sector and the gov the then uh, minister for petroleum and, and president the, the ruling party basically just told every, all the businesses all the banks and all the all the um, um, telecoms companies if you advertise with them you can no longer do business with government Mm -hmm. And and just like that, you know, the the advert revenue dried up almost almost overnight, you know, and um, and it wasn't long before the newspaper followed. So when premium time started, we there was a clarity of uh, of recognition that you've got to build something if you're going to challenge the powers that be, you've got to build something that to a large degree um, holds as the first objective sustainability. So um, I, I think where we started, and this is all also gets into um, some of the solutions that we uh, alluded to, is that we started by, you know, starting up um, PTCIJ, which essentially was supposed to be like a civil society um, um, grant receiving organization that could leverage philanthropic funds to um, turn around and fund journalism. And then also leverage things like the technologies and the tools that we build to do our journalism to also um, for commercial purposes so that we can use that to um, for journalism. And somewhere along the line, uh, uh, we, we, look, we look, look up to Daily Maverick a lot. Um, we also experimented with the membership model to see if we can get the people who um, are interested in our content and who read our content to contribute something. And because we also didn't want a situation where we then put a paywall on our journalism, we then want we then try to try to experiment with the model where we say, you know, give us something. You know, if you think if you like what we're doing, give something. But many in I, and I, I'm curious to hear the you know the successes that um, um, they, a little bit more about the successes of Daily Maverick. Um, in in our context, you know, it was a bit of a struggle um, making that you know work effectively. Um, but what we found to work effectively in our context is being able to turn around and take the, the tools and the content that we create and, and der to derive commercial value. Because in, we, there, there is something to, to you know, the tools and the skills and the content that we create. Um, so so that's, that's where we, we found you know, a little bit of success. But ultimately, um, the point we are all making is that if we're going to be able to serve effectively, and, 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 and I, I talked a little bit about the a little bit about the financial constraints that we face. I, I really also want to talk about the physical constraints and the legal constraints that we face as well, um, because that may not be the case in in South Africa. In Nigeria, very, for example, very, very much, very much so, very much, much. <laughs> very much. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I've, I've, so got, Nigeria, I've got, I've got eight, eight slap suits right now. Eight slap suits right now. Eight. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Not so excellent, <laughs> but uh... I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's excellent, but you know. <laughs> that's that's more than we do. That's more than we do. So 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 there's also the reality of that, and uh, I saw a question on the chat box where. Um, where someone asked, um, is there a way to engage a larger audience in advocating for, for the freedom? And I think that there's no way to do it, but to do that is to, one, the approach we have towards press freedom, and I, I, I think it's been um, somewhat successful, not 100% not successful, but somewhat successful, is that if you go as a broomstick, you're easily broken. But if you come as a bunch, it's hard to break a bunch. So the approach we've, we've taken towards um, um, countering the issues of press on freedom um, is to come as a bunch, is to build coalitions. And that co those coalitions have to be beyond just the press. They have to 
encompass the whole gamut of civil society and accountability framework of government, which means bringing the judicial, um, um, the judicial environment along and then finding a way to carry a, a, along the judiciary um, in, in advocating for issues around press, press freedom. Um, and and that's, it's, it's in doing that that we have found very modest success, you know, in um, say A, initially getting um, the Freedom of Information um, Bill passed in 2011, but over time also being able to uh, pull back, push back a little bit on issues of press learning. And from time to time when there are issues where a journalist is arrested or, or, um, or there's a law case, lawsuit against the journalist, uh, because we come as a bunch, it's harder to, um, for, to be suppressed. And, and that's the, those are the, and I'm curious how um, folks in other parts of the, of the world you know, are going about this because I mean, we're not, <laughs> we're, we're Nigeria, um, it's not all roses, but um, I'm curious how folks in other parts of the world and if there are other ideas that people have as to how to tackle this, um, this challenge. So, so I, I think we could also say it's not, it's not all roses anywhere. I, I don't think that anyone <laughs> has solved this problem. And, and, I, and I, think, I think that uh, uh, there are two questions that have been asked uh, and I, I'm gonna add a, another one and I'm gonna kind of try to relate them. So, so, so one is um, the discussion thus far has um, uh, been centered around uh, the kind of struggle between um, uh, um, press freedom, press autonomy, uh, effective quality journalism and the state and economic exigencies, the challenges of e economic exigencies. And I wonder uh, about the relationship between the journalistic enterprise uh, and uh, not the state or um, kind of economic e exigencies, but what, what about the relationship with other institutions, other s developments in the broader society? So, uh, as you were speaking about the struggle to have a, uh, a center of respect and decency and the journalism playing that role, uh, I, as an academic, I inevitably started thinking about another institution that's in trouble worldwide, and that's the, a free university. You know, the, the universities everywhere are facing similar problems. Uh, and, and I wonder if there's some possibility of linking these two institutions that are having troubles that have both have something to do with truth uh, uh, in a way of kind of um, kind of amplify, you know, the, the working together, uh, having power beyond the power that they have uh, uh, apart from each other. So that, that, that's you know my question. But then there's also the question about relationships with other social institutions and particularly with social movements. So, so there are all kinds of, you know, um, um, to, to some extent, Istina I think is getting to this uh, when it comes to the feminist movement or community movements. So, so how does this, how can this uh, connection be not seen as um, uh, just a, uh, uh, a way of correcting proper journalistic practices, but actually empowering journalism. You know, so, so uh, 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 you know, so just as the connection with the university, I think, has some potential. Perhaps the connection with social movements uh, uh, might have a potential. You know, social movement. Now, of course, we have to come together with some understanding of who's decent and who's not. Uh, you know, that, that, that's a struggle, uh, but still struggling with that. A, 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 and, and then th there's the very big question by uh, Mariam Kurtz, who, uh, who asks, well, how do you reach a general public, you know, the, you know, the broad public, uh, uh, about with the news that you have? And, and she gives the example, uh, how do you manage to report the investigative stories informing or engaging uh, the po uh, the public about, for example, COVID, uh, you know, uh, which is an immense problem. I, I you know, I'm, I, I, I imagine in Africa, I know uh, for sure in the United States, we have, the, you know, a, a huge part of the American public that uh, 
seems to be be willfully ignorant about uh, um, 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 you know the problems we, we face concerning COVID. So maybe I asked too much. Did I ask too much, or do you have something? Uh, 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 to say so, so connection connection let's do it one at a time connection to the university do you is there has has anyone done any work with the universities uh, uh, and made common cause or not so no? we so we do a oh. lot of work with universities and and um, this um, also goes to the one point that I think Christina was making earlier about um, the media having a role. And so to, just to be clear, um, the role of media in democracy, and, I, and, and Branko also mentioned this, uh, is beyond just accountability. It's also setting the agenda, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and especially in the context of um, Africa, where there's a, a significant development imperative. Um, um, it, it's a, there's, a, there's definitely, you know, a human rights issue that we advocate for the issues of the little guy and, and the issues that democracy needs to be tackling. Um, so, so for us, it's very important. And one area where we see the media to be uh, uh, some, somewhat deficient is in the depth of you know, development discourse um, that is happening in the media. So one of the areas that we set out to tackle um, at CGID is um, the journalism, innovation and development is to then see how we can work with the academia um, to bring issues of development to the fore and to then turn around and train journalists to ask, you know, to, to ask the right questions and investigate the, um, the right stories and to find, to tell the right stories, investigate the right issues so that we can, as you know, the one, um, um, hopefully the, um, the, the center point for truth um, be the voice for truth on these issues. So that is true um, for COVID as it is for um, issues of um, insecurity, as it is for um, our coverage of issues um, around um, say education or climate change or whatever. You. So, so it's really important that those collaborations between media and academia are strengthened mm -hmm. and are, 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 are sustained. Um, so for us, that's, that's, that's really critical. Go, Istina. <laughs> so for us in um, Sierra Leone, um, I think lots of what um, Toby is saying is happening because we have lots of um, the um, ones who are um, working or who are lecturers or professors at the university also owning newspapers. So that's, I, th I think that's a good thing because we want to also set the stage for the ones who are coming from university to be able to go into and delve into issues or be journalists who represent the truth. But I want to speak more on the issues around elite voices because I saw it on the question right. uh, and the Q and A section here. Yeah. So how do we remove elite voices? It has taken over, I would want to establish first because whenever we have issues in Sierra Leone and that's what led me to work for Honor Radar because with Honor Radar, what Honor Radar does is um, you interview or you talk to people with lived experience, they have more insight than we think or than we usually neglect in the media. So we always feel like, oh, when, when there is an issue or there is a particular topic, say we, we are talking about austerity or we are talking about politics, we can only talk to polit politicians on the ones who are vying for polit political positions or the ones who have been there. But the ones who are there in communities, the lived experiences, the ones who, 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 who face the most problem would have the, more, uh, the most thing to say. And that's what has been dying or we have been neglecting as um, media institutions in Africa. We just focus on these uh, elite voices. So taking away the elite voices and replacing them with lived experiences. Yeah, it's always okay, like if there is an issue you have to, you, but you firstly have to examine the uh, lived people with lived experience, people who are in the community. So when I started working for Honor Radar, what people would say when we go to them, they would say, oh, for so long, you guys will just come when you need us. But stories build over time. So working with communities and also focusing on community solutions to solve some of the problems will help a lot. 
So in terms of saying community media, what will change for community media is making people own the process. So in so many communities, the, the, the people in the community just feel that um, these media are owned by government or by stakeholders who have who make decisions in this community. But making sure that the people Oh, we lost her. Looks like the internet is. Okay, so, so, so Asha, she'll come back, but do, do you want to kind of uh, uh, riff on this theme that we're developing? And I, I have to say that I didn't mean to suggest that the universities are a savior. I think that the universities are deep, as deeply troubled as uh, journalist, journal, journalistic institutions are. No, I, I agree with you. I'm, I work, um, I sort of like navigate both worlds because I teach at the university. So I teach undergraduate uh, journalism classes in Nairobi. And I think it's just a question of relevance. Sometimes I do see the frustration specifically from students because that, that is the first uh, sort of like point of contact for universities. The first client is the student. And a lot, of, a lot of young students are dropping out. They don't see the relevance of the, of, of, of the university. They don't see the relevance of the academic world. And I think it's sort of like the same question we're grappling on our side. Do audiences find us relevant? Um, what, what do we add to their lives, right? Mm. It's such a complex, ever-evolving world. And you know, today, if you wanna get my attention in this world where everyone is competing for my one minute, my 10 seconds, uh, TikTok is I think 30 seconds now. I want to know why, why should I pay attention to you? So I think that's a question that we really need to think about. Um, there's somebody in, on, the, on the chat and I, and I hope I haven't messed it up by, by answering the question directly to them. But I really liked this question that um, this person, one of, the, one of the listeners, the participants called Jude asked, about the polarization and tribalization, saying that they're often spearheaded by the media who justify this bias on the basis of values. How can we build a media that is not beholden to the right or left, not beholden to one tribe or another? Fidelity to facts is a currency that actually buys little or nothing in terms of listenership. I really liked that question because I think it, it all boils down to one point that Branko raised about um, restoring fundamental decency. And I think it cuts a across board, uh, whether in media, whether in academia, um, how do we restore it? First, it's the issue of relevance, but two, it's the issue of you know, common values, common human values like respect, right? Um, and I just thought to Jude's question that for media specifically, audiences want to be met with decency, they want to be met with uh, respect, they want to be to be met with. Um, they want they want to be open minded enough. Um, the portrayal, for example, of the Trump supporters by U.S. media as either illiterate or uh, you know I don't know dumb. There are all these perceptions that were built about about Trump supporters. I feel drove them even further away from facts, from truth, from from dis decent discourse. Um, I was just seeing that you know there was research that was done in 2019 showing that nearly three quarters of Republicans said that the news media doesn't understand people like them. I mean, I think the the answer to every a lot of the questions we're asking is just about going back to the basics. What do you want as a human being? You know, you want respect. You want decency. You want to be understood. You want to be heard. You want your voice hard, right? And so all these conversations we're having around academia, around community media, boils down to that. Do you serve, what is your relevant to this person's everyday life, to the things that make them feel like they're a decent human being existing in a world that sees people like them, that understands people like them? I'm not sure whether it's too philosophical, <laughs> but that, it's, but in a nutshell, no, that's, no, that's I, what I, I think. I, I, th I think, I think, I think it's a, I think it's a mentally practical uh, and challenging, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, but, but uh, ext also extraordinarily difficult. Uh, I, I, yeah. Go ahead, Bronco. I, I, I would add um, just a couple of things that um, Asha said. Um, 
first, I think it's important to add um, that the people need to feel to belong, that they belong. Okay. And, and uh, uh, the sense of belonging trumps everything. Uh, excuse my pun. Uh, it trumps the, um, you know, devotion to truth and everything else. And it's it's really been um, that sense of belonging has been been lost by many people. And to be honest, you know, the arrogant media is not going to um, provide them with that sense. You're not going to uh, give them feeling that they actually belong to 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 to, to a group who had, who actually matter. You know, um, I also need to add and uh, to your to your universities, um, you know, and, and other group that, um, so we, we, we have a great relationship with the universities and uh, uh, most of the academics uh, are colonists, but we have a, uh, also the, the civil society as a, as a massive, massive um, um, group that is always, always in battle. They never have enough money. They never have enough um, um, power. Um, but civil society is a is a is a wonderful ally to Delhi Merrick, and I I would argue that um, um, you know every media house that um, is hoping to 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 serve its 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 own um, you know people sh should be at at the very least uh, um, you know um, you know um, in at, in in good terms with civil society and at the very best. Uh, often working together. Yeah, except what civil society is, and who, who's in and who's that's out. A, it, it, okay, that, that, that is a question. <laughs> that is a same, same as religion. Religion. What is yes. religion, and who, who? Yeah, exactly. No, I, 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 you know, I when I was thinking of uh, when I brought up the university, I was also thinking of religious institutions, uh, but uh, you know. In defense of the American uh, arrogant American media vis-a-vis -vis Trump voters, uh, um, uh, it's extra it's extraordinarily difficult to um, uh, uh, communicate uh, across these uh, really tribal divides that exist in our society and and. Uh, uh, there are institutions that are dedicated to deepening those divides, and uh, and 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 that's where I would say it, 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 there's not equal blame on the left and the right in the United States, or, uh, or, or the the media and you know the mainstream media and the uh, the, the uh, right wing media. Uh, yeah, we, we we don't we don't we don't go out to destroy. Yeah. That 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 that, that we not we don't we not set to destroy. We are set to actually build. And I think that's a, that's a difference uh, which is quite yeah, important. Yeah. No. And, and then thinking of the paper that uh, uh, Toby uh, uh, presented to us uh, uh, before our discussions. You know, when when uh, you know religious fundamentalists are uh, kind of purposefully dividing uh, Nigerian society. And not allowing uh, a woman to, uh, you know, make a, a simple suggestion that perhaps uh, uh, not everything should be religious, or uh, uh, and, and then that person is murdered. Uh, how do you bridge that divide? I mean, they're, they're real. You know, all of us live in societies where these very, very deep divides between not only left and right, this political position and that political position. But the decent and the indecent is actually a part of it. Now, I know that uh, uh, not any particular religious tradition is exclusively implicated in this, that, that uh, you know, from various re uh, religious traditions, major religious traditions, there are important voices against this. Uh, uh, and so, so then the struggle is how do you link up with uh, uh, people who are different from you, who think f fundamentally differently about the world, uh, and uh, uh, but who actually recognize your, uh, uh, your existence. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I think that we're all facing that. Uh, yeah, in terms of religious divide, sorry for cutting you, Jeffrey. 
my internet is really unstable. In terms of religious divides in Sierra Leone, what um, we have been able to manage um, to do is getting um, religious leaders in an organization. So the Muslims and the Christians, we have been able to get them in an organization that we called um, Chris Lag. So like Christian and Islam. So we, we have that organization. So when there is an issue like COVID-19 and there's lots of misinformation, we use the, the religious organization as a tool. But first it starts with getting them to, to think that no matter what, the nation comes first. So we, um, we were coming from a, um, 11 years civil war and some of the civil war um, the issues behind it was um, some religious uh, um, issues. It was some um, tribalism and all the other kinds, corruption, people were tired, people were suppressed. Their voices were not being heard. So it caused 11 years civil war in my country, a country of seven to 8 million people, lots over, I mean, thousands died in 11 years. So, but what we did was after that 11 years civil war, um, we, we, we went back to the drawing table and look at this issue about, we know that everybody believes in what they believe in. I, I sat in, 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 in vehicles or Kekena Pep, how they call it in Nigeria, wherein you would see Keke drivers saying that a woman should not leave the house. A woman should be in, in the house to take care of the children. But when it comes to, there are lots of um, religious leaders who I think will be like a tool to propagate the messages and making sure that they break the divide that is deepening each and every time that there is a religious altercation or something. So that's the first step in bringing together and making sure that they are carrier of messages, important, verified and trustworthy messages. They can use it as a sermon in their mosque. They can use it as a, a sermon in their church. That's, what, that's very important in breaking the divide. And in Sierra Leone, it's a small country, so I know it's easy to manage. I would not compare Sierra Leone and Nigeria because I've been to Nigeria and I know the issues. But um, what I would say is we're looking at it and making sure that ones who are leading or who are ahead to see uh, like the, or put the country first, to put truth first and making sure that lives are saved. So propagating these messages and using the media as a tool to help to guide that will help a lot in that area. Yeah, and then before I, I stop talking, I think um, other issues that we could do is um, the media, there's- Let, let, let me interrupt you just for a minute. Go Lala, ahead, please. Lala, can we go a few minutes over? Uh, yes, we have time, oh, if okay, everybody okay. is okay with that. So, so, so officially we have two minutes left. Uh, so let's kind of realize that we're coming to the end, but, but uh, the, um, we can end gracefully without cutting anyone off. So I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Isnina, but pr proceed. So um, the media needs lots of attention and investment poured into it to be able to survive. And I'm saying this in the context of West Africa and Sierra Leone to be specific. So then also the media need to provide content that challenge societal issues. And it's going, it's lacking every year you see that the media is deteriorating, but we need to go back to where we started, where I mean, we, we, we prized um, um, gatekeeping as the, the sole uh, um, responsibility of the media and civil society. And we need to form maybe mergers as well, because we're considering doing that in Sierra Leone, forming um, like these uh, organizations where in, um, we're not only media organizations, like women in the media, we also work with um, human rights organizations, women's led or women's organizations, propagating issues around women. So when there is rape issues, these people, they, they, if there is an issue to investigate, they tip to us like that, this is happening, we need you guys to investigate. And when we feel bullied, the, um, the civil society in Sierra Leone, they will, they will get out there, they will demonstrate, they would, they, they would send out press release, they would send out um, messages saying that we are totally against this as civil society. So we need to form this strong uh, um, support system. The media cannot operate alone. We need a stronger support system. And meaning we need institutions who are ready and willing to support democracy to stand strongly behind us. I'll stop there because I know others would want to say something.
Well, I, I, I think that what we can do is we can, uh, I, I can ask you all to, uh, uh, everyone else to uh, um, add their final thoughts. And, uh, and as you're uh, uh, thinking about what final statement you'd like to make, uh, there's one unanswered question uh, that comes from uh, someone who's identified as YT. Uh, do you think freedom of speech or controlled speech is better for truth? Uh, which is uh, a very, very big question, uh, but may have, for some of us, a pretty direct answer. So, but um, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Bronco if you have any final thoughts that you want to uh, I, I, to offer. I, 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 I'm not sure that, to be honest, I, you know, I'm gonna get skewered for this, but uh, I, I would I would argue for qualified franchise. <laughs> the same freedom of expression is, you know, you need to be able to actually say something that makes sense, <laughs> you know, that, that is connected with brain, you know, and it's not evil, um, um, be it as it may. Um, look, I, I, we didn't even touch the issue of um, of the damage that uh, the, the social media wrecked. Um, uh, all, all our society and the uh, damage that they doing to to um, um, to the media and the fact that they are uh, completely reckless and completely disinterested in any kind of uh, um, vetting or curating the, of their content unless the curation is is to actually create more chaos and more you know engagement which actually means more more violence and more more anger on the, on, on their platforms um i do i do believe that um you know without solving the um the social media issue we're not going to be able as a society to 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 um continue to 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 um you know to move forward um i believe the old issue of is the social media platform or is it the media house it's been long time for a long time has been been answered the media house and um, sorry, media, their media business. Um, and as a media business, I really don't see any problem and any reasons why they shouldn't be uh, held responsible uh, at the same level as we are. Uh, in terms of um, uh, our fight for survival, again, it's really important. The massive part of our survival is actually going to be what is going to happen to, to the um, to social media that essentially took 90% of the all the advertising of the table uh, for the digital um, for digital media. Um, something will have to happen there. They will either have to start paying tax for it or either they will actually just have to become as responsible as we are. Um, uh, in terms of um, um, uh, fight for the for the soul of our societies, um, I think we still have a chance. Um, but then the window is narrowing, and I think we need everybody on board. And when this year um, started, I told everybody I met, and I keep still saying them, this year is, for South Africa is, year, is a year of all hands on deck. And I really um, feel that for, for the media and for the continent of Africa, uh, we are in such existential crisis right now that we need all hands on deck, all the well-meaning people, all the people who believe in truth and trust as a as a fundamental of our societies. Uh, we need all hands on deck because we are under unprecedented attack. And uh, I would also call um, for um, we actually uh, we are busy asking for the um, 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 certain laws to be introduced to South African into South African system, and we will after after that happens. Hopefully, we will we will actually um, share with you guys and share with the media in the rest of Africa what we really believe is the important um, um, step forward to, to actually making media more um, more um, uh, feasible. Um, and uh, but again, I do believe that the business leaders. Uh, religious leaders, civil society leaders, all of them need to work with us and uh, understand that, um, you know, um, if we continue like this, 
we will, you know, we will not have this debate, um, or we will have this debate from, you know, from the exile. <laughs> very, 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 very soon. Maybe, maybe we will all move to Norway, you know, and uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you know. Well, as someone who's thought about exile a number of times in my life, I, I, I came to the realization that uh, there's no place to go. So uh, that is uh, the problem. That is know, the problem. Yeah. Uh, so we have to dig in. So I'll, I'll ask yeah. uh, uh, Asha and then Toby to uh, if they want to add the, their final thoughts. Thank you, Jeffrey. I think I'm going to avoid repeating any points that the other speakers have already raised. But I'll talk about something that I, I don't know whether a lot of us think about. Um, if you know, we are calling for a resolution from the tech platforms. We want Facebook, Google, Twitter to, you know, sort of to tell us what the post-truth world will look like or what it should look like in their, in, in their books. And I know that there's a lot of activism on that front, but I wonder whether we think about the effects to audiences and specifically younger audiences, what social media has done to young audiences, um, talking about Gen Z, uh, and of course, Gen Alpha, these are the, the ones born 2010 to 2025. What effect has, you know, consumption on social media done to this generation? We always talk about a media for a generation. And I think a lot of us here can talk about, you know, TV stations, newspapers we grew up on, right? What are these kids growing up on? What is that doing to them, to their psyche, to... Um, their consumption patterns to how they view the world. And even if an intervention does come in terms of tech platforms and algorithms and how they work, then how do we navigate the issue of the people we're speaking to, the audiences? And this is, a, I think, a, a, a question that uh, media, people in academia, you know, researchers should really be thinking about, specifically in Africa, because that is the majority of the population. Right. Yeah. So Toby. Wow, that's, that's a very thoughtful point. Um, so I'll just pick on the, the three key points um, again. And so I think from where, where press freedom is concerned, I think, um, I, Asha, you mentioned something earlier about the digital migration. And I think that there are real risks there because it then creates a simple, single point of, um, of censorship where governments can really just go turn off some TV station that is not saying what they want or turn off some um, online news media that they do not want. So I, I really do think that there is a lot of work for media uh, working with civil society to um, where legislation and judicial um, 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 rulings are concerned to make sure that we, we entrench um, digital rights and digital freedom, press freedom, and more strongly um, in, in our respective democracies, um, whether that would be through strategic litigation, whether that's through um, um, lobbying, um, um, traditional um, legislative processes, um, they definitely, we, we all need to, all hands need to be on deck to write or rewrite laws. In Nigeria, for example, there, there is the NBC, the Nigeria Broadcasting Corporation laws that are very repressive of media and that we, we need to rewrite. So that is, and as digital migration happens, we've got to ensure that digital rights and digital freedom um, is, is protected on those platforms. And to the second point I wanna make on this, um, and it also goes to the issue of disinformation, is that we, we've got to do a better job uh, perhaps of I like the way Branko said it that maybe, you know, that maybe tech companies need to be more responsible and pay taxes of some sort, but we also need to find ways to collaborate um, effectively with tech companies um, um, because I, I think increasingly they are aware of this problem as well. So um, whether it be through fact checking, um, and I, I really do believe that to the question about freedom of expression, I really do believe you know, in the words of John Stuart Mill, that, you know, all expression, as long as it doesn't harm others, should be allowed. However, um, especially where if expression is, is intended to cause harm, 
I do not think all expression deserves the same amount of distribution. Um, and this is where, you know, you collaboration with the tech companies to ensure that, you know, um, we, we work in, working with, um, you know, objective media, we can, you know, we, we, we don't give the same, the, the, you know, right now they basically just give um, prioritize engagement over relevance and truth. And we, we've got to um, make sure, you know, tech companies revise their algorithms, you know, to sort of pull back on that and, and prioritize truth over engagement. And, and to the final point um, about sustainability, I, I think that this is a, a challenge that we will continue to work, uh, work on and, 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 um, and um, um, as media companies around the world, um, we, this is a, an ongoing conversation um, that needs to go on because the media needs to be sustainable um, if it's going to do its work well. And part of that has to come from us really thinking differently about our business models. Um, we can't just rely on adverts anymore. We've got to think of other ways um, to, to bring in revenues um, so that we can be sustainable. Thank you all. This was a very, very interesting conversation. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, really amazed at uh, how uh, you for share common concerns and judgments, see, see, uh, uh, see the problems more or less in, in the same way and are struggling with these problems. Uh, uh, creatively as you're trying to engage them, and also how familiar the problems are that you describe as you experience them in Africa to the experience, experiences I have in North America. And as someone who has had a lot of experience in Eastern Europe, spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's really, I, I think that in many ways, it seems that the war in Ukraine is very, very far from you, but it's amazing to me how the problems you describe as you're experiencing them in your countries are actually manifested in the war in Ukraine, because so much of the war in Ukraine has to do with uh, the media various media doing their job and not, and people realizing their problems uh, uh, accurately or being manipulated to see them quite inaccurately. So that's a, just a current events side note. Uh, um, I, I uh, really thank you and, and hope that we can continue the, this conversation. Uh, 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 I thank uh, everyone who presented uh, uh, their ideas officially and uh, openly uh, in, in the discussion and also the people in the audience. And I do hope th that we actually figure out ways uh, to work together in the future to continue our conversation because indeed if uh, a world that has this conversation is much better than a world that doesn't have this conversation. So, it, 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 you know, I, I, I've long uh, bristled at the idea that talk is cheap. I think talk is actually very, very important because in silence in the present moment is actually uh, um, very, very dangerous. So our having this conversation is very, very important. But I also think that our next step as a group is to actually highlight uh, um, instances, case studies, of how people are breaking through these problems. So I would love to know how that's the details of the nitty gritty details of how people in community journalism in Sierra Leone are dealing with these problems. Because I know it's, it's not just that the problems are overwhelming them or that they are heroically uh, overcoming the problems, but there's an ongoing struggle. And to know more about that struggle would be very, very interesting. I'm not gonna go through, uh, I'd like to know more about the Maverick and about its uh, sister institution in Nigeria and, uh, and indeed about the, uh, um, the ways that we might figure out uh, 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 to address this uh, behemoth 
of uh, social media and, and how uh, uh, we can turn uh, our interact interconnectivity that is so glorious. We have this conversation uh, now uh, uh, and, and turn it into something uh, and fight against its very, very pernicious um, aspects. So, uh, and, and particularly on the youngest of generations. I, I, I think that uh, Asha really points to a crucial question. Uh, how, how do they, how do people coming up, how does the world look like to them? How do they understand? Uh, when we speak about uh, decency, uh, it, is that this actually something that they, they perceive? How do they perceive de decency? Uh, th these are really important questions and uh, we can't address them fully today, but we can uh, be pleased that we've at least raised them and commit ourselves, I hope, together uh, to continue uh, the, our explorations uh, for answers to the questions. So thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to uh, work with you and I look forward to our work together in the future.